Okay, um, for our next talk, I would like to uh, welcome Zas, who will uh, be talking about uh, how to uh, hacking drive, uh, driverless vehicles. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you. I, I can't believe this room. It's like I'm addressing the United Nations or something. It's, it's uh, extremely exciting, it's including the, the representative from the, the country of Anonymousia over here. Uh, so this is Hacking Driverless Vehicles. Uh, quick self-intro about myself. Um, I have an academic background in autonomous robots, uh, but perhaps what I'm best known for is a cable TV show uh, that I did a few years ago called Prototype This, where we uh, tried to hack together some cool demos, including several that involved autonomous vehicles. And uh, one of the other people on the show with me was Joe Grand, AKA Kingpin, who's here in the, in the front corner row there. And we'll be talking tonight after dinner, your after dinner entertainment is uh, more info about some of these cool projects. But here's a tiny preview about some of the ones relevant to this talk. Uh, we did a homebrew UAV system to help protect unguarded beaches. So it would fly out into the ocean and drop you a life preserver if you got into trouble. And we learned a lot about unmanned aerial systems uh, doing this. Um, you could say it was an, an iterative process. We learned a lot about failures of unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, we also did driverless ground vehicles uh, for one of the more pressing technological challenges in the ground vehicle space, which is maintaining the American lead in high efficiency pizza delivery. So here's the solution for local autonomous pizza delivery, sharing routing space with pedestrians on the sidewalk, and the long distance method operating in the shared automobile network. This Pizza delivery uh, to Treasure Island in San Francisco was the first ever autonomous crossing of a United States highway bridge in the service of pizza. Uh, it can be hard to convince even a human driver to make that trip, uh, so screw them. Who, who needs it? Make, let's let the robot do it. Um, more recently, I've been involved in a lot of autonomous vehicle competitions for RoboNation and the AVSI Foundation. So there's a ground vehicle competition, two aerial vehicles, two boat competitions and a submarine competition, and those are live, live streamed on the web, several of them, and you can, you can watch them. Uh, but the motivation for this talk, I wanted to, to say quickly, um, I'm a huge fan of autonomous and unmanned systems. Uh, I think they are the future of transportation and many other industries, and they're definitely coming because there are so many advantages, uh, such as energy efficiency, not having to carry a human driver, not having to carry support for the human driver, like food and water and bathrooms, or have to stop for, uh, for acquiring those. Many things on that list. Also time savings, not having to deal with fatigue, boredom, no time spent with rest stops, operator changeovers, that kind of thing. And then all the new applications that are enabled when it wasn't practical uh, or economical before to do that with a human operated system. So not re replacing jobs, but actually enabling new areas uh, and new places that we can go and, and uh, explore. So I say you can't stop the robot revolution even if you want to. It's coming. But like everything else that humans have ever made in history, these are going to be hacked. So I want to start talking about it now as we're kind of on the cusp of this revolution before the systems are too entrenched uh, for us to go back on certain decisions that are made. I'm sure everyone in this room can think of an example of a decision in technology that was made a long time ago that we're still having to live with. Um, this has uh, particular relevance to Europe at the moment. The American efforts in this, in this uh, space have been getting a lot of the press, but in Europe, the UK has announced on-road trials of driverless vehicles in three cities starting next year. Uh, and to go along with that, a 10 million pound research fund. Sweden is giving Volvo permission to invade Gothenburg with 100 driverless vehicles in 2017. That's a few years off. But surely, many other countries in Europe are not going to want to get left behind and are going to want to quickly follow suit. And again, we know in technology that haste and playing catch up often leads to bad security decisions. Um, but with all that said, what I don't want to do here is spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Far from it. Um, this isn't going to be some kind of alarmist anti-robot propaganda. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure for me to come to Europe and put two Hitler jokes on the same slide. I hope it's not too soon. Um, but this, this is not what this is about. Um, it's not about stopping the robot revolution. It's not about interfering with the, de the deployment of these systems. It's about getting it right. Um, 
And I really got a sense of the, how unmanned systems of the future when I got a chance to grab this video of the Fire Scout helicopter um, a little over a year ago at the Unmanned Aerial Systems Competition. So this is a US military unmanned scout helicopter and it's doing an autonomous takeoff and hover and then it's gonna go and fly some autonomous tests and I really got a sense when I took this video, it's like, wow, yeah, let's let the robot drive. It's really good at it, right? It's really, really stable. Um, so I'm not trying to interfere with that but my point is I'm doing this for hackers and hacking, I mean in the old school sense of discussion, analysis, figuring out how things work and what's wrong with them and how to improve on them. So it's about getting people excited to contributing to that and to the eventual acceptance of driverless vehicles. So we're gonna talk about vulnerabilities and interference uh, with driverless systems, but out of love, kind of, kind of tough love. So speaking of managing vulnerabilities, this Fire Scout is, is very stable, as I mentioned, but the operators, if you look closely, it's hard to see on that slide, they're hiding in almost, you know, seemingly terror behind the start card, just in case. So that's a security mindset, right? It's like, yeah, we made this robot, we know how good it is, we're still gonna hide behind a heavy thing when we take it off. So when I talk about exploits and, and countermeasures against robot vehicles, your job as the audience is to think about counter countermeasures and ways that the system can, be, uh, can have its robustness increased. That's how we develop bulletproof systems. The unmanned system space is really wide. Um, it doesn't just mean full on robots. Uh, it just means that there's not a human driver or pilot on board. You might have uh, an offboard controller or supervisor, so for supervised autonomy. Um, you may still have plenty of humans on board that just aren't piloting it. You might have a safety pilot or you might have a whole lot of passengers. And as we know, up until now, the field has been largely dominated by the military. Military funding and military applications. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I don't need to get into now. But a, a significant amount of this uptake in the military space has been in aerial systems. And that seems a little counterintuitive at first because aerial systems can fall out of the sky and crash easily. But there's a lot of things about the air that makes deployments simpler. For example, the fact that it's a low probability of running into something as long as you're still up in the air. So here's one representative system, this is the Global Hawk. And they've published um, in unclassified form the uptake in terms of flight hours of Global Hawk. And you can see that it looks pretty much like a, an exponential curve. And the government, especially in the United States, is really interested in pushing this exponential uptake into other domains as well. So 12 years ago, Congress insisted that by next year, by 2015, one third of all uh, military ground vehicles were to be unmanned. Um, obviously, it's okay for the people giving the money to say whatever the hell they want. Uh, they're not the technologists and they can't make it happen and it's not going to happen by 2015, but the will is there. But I'm not gonna talk much more about military vehicles uh, because the capabilities are classified largely. Um, they already have a very keen interest in resistance to adversarial engagements um, and there's a different cost equation with respect, for example, to sensors, high quality sensors and ones that are resistant to uh, some of the techniques that we'll talk about. And also, most of us in the civilian space will never really encounter one. Um, unless we you know, go all Snowden and have, people, have a lot of people after us, hopefully we'll never run into one. Um, so, for example, in the military space, there are driverless ground vehicles with threats designed in mind. This is a uh, kind of sentry droid for the army, and as you can see, it's absolutely covered in various weapons uh, and a lot of redundant sensors. Um, it's, this one's kind of funny to me though because this is a prototype and so you just have to get close enough to this to press one of these kill switches that are all over the robot. So it's kind of like putting an unshielded reactor exhaust port on the Death Star. You know, you just, you just gotta hope someone remembers to remove that from the production version. But these are gonna sh start showing up not just in the military space but kind of in our backyards all over the place. So obviously transportation, uh, friends of ours at a particular tech company which I don't wanna single out but we'll mention them a little bit. Um, Oceanography is huge, uh, sub submersibles and, uh, and boats. Uh, terrestrial mapping, um, they're all the rage now in camera control. You can buy a really kick-ass uh, stabilized camera, camera drone uh, now from, from China for like $1,000, $1,500 fully loaded. Um, operates out to a kilometer, really, really nice. Uh, power line inspection is huge. There's hundreds of thousands of kilometers of 
power line that needs to get inspected and uh, robots are an efficient way to do that. And of course, logistics and delivery, all kinds of other things like that. Uh, here's another Europe example. Rolls-Royce Maritime Division just announced that they think that the future of cargo shipping is completely unmanned. And I'm actually making a documentary right now about civil applications of unmanned boats because they're kind of the least explored area of unmanned systems. But there's starting to be a really, really big push there. Uh, and that's partly because 75% of maritime accidents are caused by human error. And the major technical challenge of doing unmanned boats is dealing with hardware failure over really long voyages. Obviously, there's, uh, there's hacking and security concerns, but the fact is some of these missions go for, for weeks or months and things break. Um, but if you talk to this, the industry advocacy group for uh, civil applications of unmanned vehicles, these are their two priorities. Precision agriculture, combine, combine harvesters, a lot of the things that perform agriculture right now are practically robots already. They do uh, GPS uh, guidance and localization. Um, and then self-driving cars. So they're the big two, wide applicability over all countries which, which do food production and transportation, which is basically all of them. Um, and the big roadblocks to civil domain uptake, uh, use of shared infrastructure, sharing them with manned vehicles. If we could take all the manned vehicles off the roads right now, then we could deploy this stuff immediately. But having the robots interoperate with humans makes it difficult. Hand in hand with that, acceptance. Safety and robustness demonstrations, but also the public perception of it, making sure people believe that they're safe and robust. Uh, and of course, privacy as well. That's being um, written into the FAA guidelines on um, unmanned aerial system regulations, even though the FAA in the United States really has nothing to do with privacy, but people are so concerned about it that it's being written in. But safety and robustness, uh, you know, now we've got that out of the way, the fun stuff to talk about is failure. So here's a couple of classic failures. First of all, in the aerial space, this is the uh, Boeing RQ-3 Dark Star. There's a single surviving one in the Smithsonian Mu Museum of Air and Space in DC. If you ever visit DC, visit DC, you can go and look at it. This was ultimately supposed to cost $10 million per unit, right? So units 11 to 20 after they finished all the development work. But the prototype's obviously a lot more expensive. The first prototype of the RQ-3 failed catastrophically on its very first flight. Uh, uh, sorry, on its second flight, its second takeoff, actually. And I've, I've seen, personally, with my eyes, the video of this, I was not able to get a copy to show it with you, so you're just gonna have to imagine that and let me talk you through it. Um, but here is the takeoff run of the RQ-3 um, prior to the, this is, this is a, a successful takeoff run, maybe the first flight. The second flight, imagine that takeoff run, but imagine it starting to kind of jump a little bit on the, on the runway as it starts to take off, and those oscillations getting bigger and bigger, increasing amplitude until eventually pitches nose up, stalls, crashes, fireball, millions of dollars down the drain. So here's the quote about what happened from the uh, Journal of Unmanned Systems Engineering. Um, Porpoising oscillations, pretty cool term, uh, leading to a nose high stall and a crash. What, so what happened? Well, what happened was the designers who modeled the flight control system and developed that, the, the takeoff run modeled it on an asphalt runway. Smooth surface, no seams. The actual takeoff run was done on a prefabricated concrete runway that had small, tiny, like quarter inch seams between the concrete plates. Those small impulses from those seams that were shocking the aircraft's wheels as it took off gave inputs to the inertial sensors that were under damped and overcorrected, and we saw a classic positive feedback loop leading to a crash. Catastrophic failure, millions of dollars down. So the moral of that story, what the morals are, the expectations of the designers are critical. Even a seemingly trivial detail, like the runway composition, can be the difference between success and failure. And if exploitation is gonna occur, it's likely to happen at those cracks between the boundaries of people's expectations. Here's another failure example. This is an, another classic. This uh, is from the, DARPA, the first DARPA Grand Challenge, an autonomous robot race between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, 2004. Um, this is Sandstorm, um, which is a, a vehicle from a spin-off from Carnegie Mellon University. And it was the favorite 
to win the first lap of Grand Challenge. It got around seven miles before it took a turn wrong and ran off the side, ended up in a weird angle, and caught fire. Um, here's two videos of Sandstorm in action. One will lead eventually to the crash, but the, the crash is down the bottom. Um, so what happened? Sandstorm had a huge team working on it, right? They, a lot of people, and they had the ability to extensively map the course beforehand. They actually had people walk the entire course um, once they got the information from DARPA about where it was going to go. Their map was so good that they could pretty